And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Melissa Gates Perry, intuitive channel who has been working with clients for 30 plus years through her guide, Aralam. The focal point of her work is uplifting, healing, and teaching people to live better lives through self-knowledge and the workings of the soul. Much of her work delves into childhood trauma and integrating those lessons with Aralam. Melissa, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, have been watching your podcast for some time, and the work that you're doing is just uh, phenomenal, just amazing work for people. Thank you. Melissa, when did you realize that you had psychic abilities? You know, um, like a lot of people, when I was a child, um, I definitely was sensitive. Um, I feel like I was sensitive to people's emotions and sensitive to things that weren't being said. Um, I was sensitive to different places and buildings and also um and and why uh the book and so many things are important about the book is that i also came from a very very difficult childhood i was born um to a 15 year old mother and a 17 year old father in 1964 and they were children you know they were young at that time particularly um and they had a lot of a lot of issues there was alcohol and drugs and a lot of crazy stuff went on. And really in the book, and and I tell people, I sort of grew up in a hippie commune for all intents and purposes. Um, and I think some people think, oh, you know, that, that would be wonderful and free. Well, no, as a child, it was pretty terrifying and not very wonderful. Um, so I grew up really becoming hypersensitive to those around me. And a lot of that was survival. It was truly just about trying to survive uh, my lifetime when I was a kid. Um, as I get older, I still realized that I was very, very sensitive and in a psychic way, but I didn't talk about it to people. I didn't, um, you know, I didn't, I, it wasn't something that I let other people know about. And then when I was 21 years old, I was living uh, back here in Vermont. I had been traveling around a bit, came back to Vermont, and I had a dear, dear friend that I um, was close with, very, very close with. And this gentleman was a friend of mine. We weren't intimate. He was just a good friend. He got involved with some folks who were doing very dark energy work. And when I say very dark energy work, um, a lot of people would say, you know, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, specifically just dark energy work can be the same way that people try to manifest things using their energy uh, for positive things. Um, dark energy work is just doing it for negative reasons and it's, and it's not good. You know, in my world, there's positive and there's negative, but dark energy work is something I don't condone, nor do I ever try to be around. So anyway, I'm young and he got involved with this and he got in too deep and eventually he came to me and he said, I'm really afraid I've gotten involved with a group of people. And he said, I've, I'm going to give you this letter. And of course, this sounds like a movie. And when I talk about this in the book in more detail, but people listen to this story and they go, this sounds like a movie, but it's true. It was my life and it's true. And it's how I met Aralim. So my friend came to me and he said, you know, I'm going to give you this letter because I'm terrified that something's going to happen to me because these people that I've been working with now, I want to get away from them. I don't want to be in this group anymore, but that's not, they're not happy about it. So he gives me a letter and I don't think too much about it. I told him you're being silly or, you know, what you do at 21, you're just being silly. Three days later, he's in a car accident with another friend and he dies. I open up the letter and he's telling me in the letter that um, they had threatened him and that he was afraid that they were doing dark energy work in order to have something bad happen to him. Now, it's not a movie. This really happened. Um, I, at that point, had never been more terrified in my life. I was 21, and I was terrified out of my mind. And it occurred to me there was no one I could really talk to about this because it was so incredible to believe. Now, this is in 1987, and so this is a very different time, right? Somebody now, I might be able to talk, to, I, I might be able to email you and say, this happened to me and I, do you have any thoughts? But at that time, this isn't something you would share with people. So that very day, I just started praying to God. And when I say God, I mean, I wasn't, I, I just started to pray in God with a capital G, 
you know, the creator of this universe, the one creator. And it didn't matter to me if I was praying to a Catholic's God or a Christian's God or a Buddhist God, or, you know, it's just the creator of the universe. That's what I was looking for. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. I mean, I was terrified, Jeff. I've, it was since, and since that time in my life, I've never felt the kind of fear where you think you're not going to survive the fear, you know? Um, so I prayed and prayed and prayed. I sort of went to bed that night, kind of passed out crying and praying. I woke up in the morning and Aralyn was there and he wasn't speaking to me the way he does now. It's easy for me to hear him all the time, but he was there. It was like a presence was there, a large comforting, um, presence of it's going to be okay. You don't have to be afraid that kind of thing. Um, it was like someone had flipped a switch in my life. And then over the next year, year and a half, I began to realize that if I just sort of calmed myself, I would get really big intuition or inclination. And then eventually just conversation with Erlam. And that was about 32 years ago. Are you and that's how I met Erlam. And again, I write in link, I, I write in very big detail about that situation and what happened. And the issue, the, the other reason why it was so terrifying is because my friend wrote to me in this letter, you cannot go to my funeral. You cannot go to my graveside. You can't be around the parties or go to celebrate my life. You can't do any of that if something happens to me, because these people are now thinking that I've talked with you about this. So I literally couldn't do any of those things. And it was a small town at that time. So for me to just not do any of those things was very odd to people. Um, and it was a really, it was just terrifying. But the other thing it did, the thing that it did for me too, I think, was it made me understand that there, there is... There is a there is a dark energy as well as God's energy. And when I say God, I don't mean one specific person's. In other words, God, from what Erlam says, if you're a Catholic, if you're a Christian, and your NDEs often talk this way as well. Um, if you're a Catholic, a Christian, a Buddhist, a Native American, you fill in the blank. If you have a good soul and good positive intentions and you go through your life trying to do the best you can do, when your body dies, everybody goes to the same place initially. Everybody does. Every soul returns back. And so for me, that was a huge realization uh, at 21 years old about the reality of who we are in our lives and, and what we're supposed to do. Is Aralem a guide, an angel, or what? Aralem is not an angel. Uh, Aralem talks about angelic beings as being a completely different species um, Aralam has had many, many incarnations as human, as a human being like you and I. So he is a guide. Um, he's a teacher guide. And on the other side, and I think your NDE people often talk about this, but Aralam will talk at length as well in the book. And he's saying to me right now, um, uh, as a guide, he would have on the other side. And again, I call it the lobby in my book because when Aralam first showed me the lobby where people go when we die, it looked to me like this beautiful, huge uh, combination of like the most glorious kind of train station, library, park, and hotel lobby where, where souls are coming and going. You know what I'm saying? Like this beautiful structure. Um, and then, you know, in certain, if I, if I sort of put my attention in one direction or the other, um, you know, the Akashic records are there. Like there's all of this world on the other side. And so I call it the lobby because it just looks like this magnificent lobby that you might sit in all day with a book and a nice cool glass of tea and just watch all the amazing souls passing by. So that's what I call it. But he is a guide. Um, he's my guide, particularly because we had had uh, multiple lifetimes together, which I only remember one of. I don't, I don't do a lot of work in remembering my past lives because, frankly, this one has turned out to be kind of awesome. So I'm very, I'm very rooted in it. But Erlam um, um, and I did have one lifetime together about 1,100 years ago. Um, he was a druid and a bard, and I was it kind of. He was my teacher then, but on Earth. Um, and so when I was getting ready to reincarnate this time. 
um, he showed up and my other family members showed up before we all came into this life. And one of the things that I made as a, as one of my soul contracts would be that if I could do it and if I could um, meet the different timelines that I would make contact with him, I would request that he be in my life um, and that he would show up and we would do this work. Um, and what we do with people um, in the sessions that we do is that um, we'll do a session with a person and it's not like a fortune telling thing. Um, Aralam is really big on getting, you know, getting to the root of somebody's issues, talking about all of their family group and the souls they've come in with and what are the problems and what are the issues and what are the possible timelines for that person. Um, because every soul, including you, has come onto this planet with sort of two or three likely timelines that depending on what decisions you make, um, those timelines will keep sort of crossing over in these junctions. And so that's why people's intuition and the work you're doing right now with the NDE folks, it's so incredibly important because the more people that start to wake up to the idea of what dying truly is, then, and, and to the person, right? When your NDE people come back, they are changed. They are completely changed. I mean, they don't, they're not going around um, being horrible to each other or being horrible to others anymore. I mean, and it's not that people come back and they're perfect angels, but boy, it changes, does it not change their outlook on life and what it means? And also, if you become less afraid of what happens when you die, then you, it, it frees you up to be such a much more productive soul while you're here, I think. How do you communicate with Aralam? Okay. So right now, as we're talking, um, I, and I'm just going to, I'm going to put my hand here for people to see. So in my, it's almost like, um, in my mind's eye, um, right sort of here above me, Aralam is just standing. He's just standing right here. It's like an opening. It's almost like, um, picture it. If, if you're in your kitchen making coffee in the morning, and your wife is in the very next room or maybe at the dining room table. You're not looking at her, but you sense and know that she's there. And you could have a conversation with her without ever looking at her, right? You're making coffee. I'm talking to you right now and Aralam is literally standing here. And if you ask me a direct question, he hears it and he will answer it. And I hear it just like I hear you. It wasn't always that way. Um, when I was much younger, um, in the first couple of years, I sort of had to go through a very, um, you know, like a calm down and almost like a semi trance thing. But once I got very used to his presence, I didn't have to do that anymore. And I love that. I don't have to do that because it's more like having a conversation in a group. Then it's like being at a really awesome cocktail party where everyone's talking about something and I'm not checked out. Like I'm also part of the conversation. So I love that. So that's how I communicate with him. It's very live for me. And as I said, he's listening to us right now and, you know, can interject and, and is talking as well. So was he there your entire life and finally reached out to you once you were in crisis or did he come after well, the crisis started? There is an actual, um, a law that the creator put into place and it has to do with soul guides. Angels, like you asked me about angels, angels are not, um, angels don't have any of the laws that human souls live by because angels are completely different species and they do not incarnate into physical bodies. So an angel can always come in and help a person whenever they feel like or the creator wants them to. Oftentimes when people feel that an angel helped them in their life, who they're really feeling is their guide because everyone has one. Nobody gets to come onto the earth plane without a guide in place. However, the covenant between you and your guide for your lifetime says that unless you ask for the assistance, you have complete free will. So say that when my friend was killed in the car accident and I was terrified, but I never started praying, I never started asking for help, I never started asking for intervention in that way, Aralam couldn't just come to me. He has to wait for me to ask. He has to wait for me to ask him to please be in my life in a concrete way. Um, and that is the, it's free will because we all have free will. Aralam, in the beginning, I would say to Aralam, 
in the first few years, I would say, what if I just want to, what if I don't want to think about any of this? What if I don't want to do sessions and I don't want to worry about helping people with their souls? What if I just want to ignore you completely, pretend I don't know you're there and just be completely in the world, just completely don't even think about my soul. And he said, you absolutely can do that. And eventually you'll die and you'll come back up here. And then you'll just know that you missed out on one of the things you were hoping to do. Like I was, you know, wanting to do. And so it's the free, free will. Um, and Erlam, um, talks about it in the book, but free will, um, is the highest law that God, whoever you want to call God, um, free will is the first and highest law that can't be broken. And it's why people can come to the planet, have great intentions, and then be complete wrecks when they get here. They can choose to just be awful, and that's your own free will to do that. But the beautiful thing about the work you're doing is that you are allowing hundreds of thousands of people who have not had near-death experiences to have the have the experience of understanding what someone else has experienced. And it resonates because your soul knows it's true. Every one of our souls. It's like Aralam says, you can be an atheist. You can be a, a, a stone cold atheist and truly believe that when your body dies, there's nothing left. There's no soul. There's no personality. There's no Jeff Mara's favorite color. There's none of that. You just are dirt and you go back to dirt. You can believe that your whole life. And then when you actually die and your soul goes back to the other side, you're just, you, you go, oh yeah, gosh, why did I do that? I, I stuck with that atheist story my whole life. Why did I do that? But that's free will. You can do that. Or you can choose to embrace all the growth, you know? Many people have basically described what you were saying about the train station and the hotel yes. lobby. But quite a few people go to what we call the black void. Can you ask Erlam what that is? Okay. So, and Erlam is saying, and he's listened to what you're asking. Um, many people, he's saying right now, the people that listen to your podcast, the people that might read my book, the people that are studying this, when they die, no matter how they die, those people tend to go toward the transition very open. They're, you know, very open souled, very open hearted, just meaning that even if you don't want to die, nobody should want to die. But when it's your time and you go about, he's telling me for, for earth, he's saying not other planets because souls can incarnate onto tons of planets, but our planet in particular, and the vibration that our bodies are at about, he's saying about 78% of people when their body dies, they, they go right over to the other side with none of that black void issue. Um, he said the other percentage, which is pretty small, it's less than a third. Those people basically, when they are suddenly dying and out of their body, they don't let go of the body very quickly because they're sort of denying, they're denying the process. They don't let go of the body. If they've had extreme pain before they left the body, if they had extreme trauma in the leaving of the body. Um, in other words, if, I mean, I don't want to be too, you know, uh, violent, but say that you died of a violent, violent death at the hands of another human being, and it was very painful and traumatic and slow, maybe. You might be a person who goes to that sort of waiting area. So the black void Erlam is saying is not hell, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to continue on, but sometimes people are so traumatized, and he's also telling me right now, when that happens, your guide will get in touch with other guides, and between eight and 15 guides will get together and basically form a circle around your soul energy, which in that black void space, you're actually creating it yourself, because it's like you're too terrorized to move. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're too terrorized to move on, but your guide will normally not let you stay there for that long. People don't stay there for that long because they are retrieved. And what they do is, um, and he's showing me to, to show you. So 16 or 18, maybe 20 guides, they, they wouldn't all be your guides, but they're like, 
kind of like soul EMS, if you want to look at it that way, will come in and they link their energy around you and sort of make a cocoon around your soul and, and sort of force your soul's energy to coalesce back into a nice uniform ball of what it should be. And then they move you on to the other side. And usually those people will stay and rest for a good long time in that cocoon before they meet family, before they come out for a review, before they come out to just be welcomed home. And so that's why that happens. But Aralam has always said, hell, as it's described in the Bible, or hell that somebody would say, you're going to go to hell. It doesn't exist. The creator did not make hell. The creator God did not make hell. Um, one of the other ways that people um, sort of experience hell or a form of hell is that when you cross over and you get there and you're going to be doing, you've met your people and you've rested and you've done whatever you're going to do. Eventually you and your guide and some of your family members possibly will have basically a review of your life. Um, and the review of your life is the time when base you, you literally look at your whole life, but the kicker here is that you get to feel and experience in real time, every single thing that you have made every other person, animal, person and animal feel or experience. So if you've gone through your life and you've done a lot of great things for people and you've made, and you've uplifted a lot of people and you've done the best you could do to be a phenomenal human, you're going to get to feel all of that joy and the relief. I mean, even small things like the day, you know, you, you, you saw a woman in line in front of you and your intuition said you should tell her that her dress is really pretty or something like that. She turns around and says, well, thank you. That means a lot to me. I've had a rough day. Well, what you didn't know maybe was that her husband had just died. She's thinking about committing suicide and just that tiny bit of joy from you, just that little bit of kindness from you changed it for her. And the feeling that she had when she got in her car after you said that to her, she cries, she releases, and she has some joy in her heart. You get to feel that. So even the small, small things that you think are very small and not very meaningful oftentimes are huge for that stranger, huge for that other person. Now, that being said, it, it it works on both sides of that stick, right? So if you spend a lifetime being frustrated and angry and telling off the people at Starbucks who are trying to make you a coffee or screaming at people in traffic or, you know, screaming at your loved ones or just being, um, you know, really, um, you know, uh, difficult and, and, you know, being horrible to people, you're going to feel all of that as well. All of that. When I say feel it, I don't mean feel it like, oh, look, they feel bad. I mean, feel it like you're going to be them for those moments to feel that. And you'll have complete truth about what it did to them. Because what you're, when you get there and you have your, your meeting about what this last, last lifetime was like, normally people have a lot of good and some bad or some difficult stuff. But the bottom line is, after you go through quite a few lifetimes, you start to realize, you know, you can't be perfect every day, but Aralam stresses, and he's shaking his head yes to stress this. Um, he stresses, what you make other people feel is the most important thing. It's more important than how you feel. It, you know, and that doesn't mean you turn into a doormat for people to abuse you. It just means how you make others feel, the people you barely know, the strangers, and the people you love the most. It's so important. It's so, so important. Is our complete self on the other side and just a little bit of us is projecting into this reality? You know, I've been asked that a lot of times. And what Aralam says is this, if you're in a human incarnation, there is literally about 94% of you in your body, Jeff Mar. You are there. You always have a tether. I, I, and I'm doing this because he's showing me. So you and I are sitting here and we always have this energetic tether, which is a piece of our soul hooked to the other side. We can never be disengaged from it. We can never be disengaged from it. Death doesn't disengage us from it. Birth doesn't disengage us from it. And what else is there really, right? You, you can't be disengaged. The only thing that can disengage you from having a little bit of yourself 
um, over on the other side with the creator is if you decided that you were going to have, well, you can't even do that because Erlim is saying that's not, a, he just said to me, that's not a good way to say it because you can't disengage your soul. Um, right now, there are folks on this planet and he's saying, there are people on this planet right now that are trying to figure out how to download the human mind into something that is a mechanical body, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with doing that is you are not your mind. So they can put your thoughts, memories, they can take your information and put that in a mechanical body. Obviously, mechanical body is a simple way to put it, but you know what I'm saying. They can put your information in there, but your soul goes back, back over, okay? So if you purposefully, and Erlim is saying to me right now, the reason that I'm saying this is because there are species out there in our universe who have literally and figuratively removed themselves from what was their souls. So they are no longer attached to the creator, what the creator wants for us. Okay. So to answer your question, the majority of us, the majority of your soul energy is sitting there with you now. It isn't that you have... 90% of your soul there, and only you're just a little tiny fragment of yourself. It's actually the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. There's a fragment of connection. But Aralam tells me, and he's saying right now, in his understanding, you're not running eight different lives at eight different times or any of that stuff. The multi-universes, he's saying the multi-universes aren't being used in that way for humans right now. Because human, he's saying humans are still very young on the process. And now he's saying there are species in this universe who are able to do that. Um, but they're not on the planet at this moment. Sometimes some of my near-death experiencer guests, when they're on the other side, appear to be plugged back into the system and they know everything and they even yes. understand why they came down. And so that's kind of why I felt like only a little piece of them are here. And once they return, they reconnect with everything. We are a soul and a body, say you right now. So you do have... And this is why the NDEs are so important. And this is also why Erlam, you know, our work is, is important right now, because the idea here is that through Erlam, I have been able to get so much more information about who I am in the largest sense of my soul, right? So it's like, but, but once you see that, and once you know it, you can't unsee it right? You you can't really unsee it. So it makes you want to kind of help other people. It makes you want to do the good work, so to speak. When, when my body drops and I travel back over, then yes, I will be reunited with my connection to everything. And you're correct. Every soul that's on the other side right now, they do have, they have they are in contact with kind of all of the knowledge that is possible. And that's true. That's true for everyone. Now, there are souls that are, are very, very high up on the, on the rungs of existence, say a Jesus or, you know, those kinds of, of savior souls who have been through the lives and they've come back and tried to bring humanity up higher. Because basically on planets like Earth, when the creator deems us ready to have a giant jump in our thought process and what we're going to do and how we're going to be, um, you know, he'll allow and send a savior, a piece of him, right? A, a piece of God that's much closer to the God source to come onto a planet and sort of tip everything upside down to give us a whole new look at things. And interestingly enough, right now, and I'm sure that you know this and most people that listen, you know, we are on a steep learning curve right now. I mean, it's a really challenging time to be alive on this planet, but it's also a phenomenal time to be here. And there's a lot of souls wanting to be here right now because earth is, you know, we are just, we are upping levels. We are jumping levels right now, amazingly quickly. And that's why we all feel a little tired you know, and a little overwhelmed, like what is happening? And most people that are kind of coming awake, like you are, and like I have, and like, you know, people that are looking into this and really studying all of this and trying to get, get real stable with their spirituality and, and their connection to the creator, you know, we're looking at it and, and not to be cliche, but it's almost like you're feeling, you're feeling the earth pulling away from energetically kind of pulling away from and up away from an old paradigm, right? The old paradigms are sort of crumbling and it's, we're in this middle ground. And so we're all getting 
a huge upgrade in knowledge and, and understanding. And I think a knowingness, right? So when souls go over and they say have an NDE and they go over and they're standing there and they're not fully engaged because obviously they're going to come back, but they're fully, you know, they're in there. Um, they suddenly realize if I stay here, I, I, I have the truth. It's like you feel the truth of everything and you have the knowledge of so many things. And it's really interesting. Um, when my mother was passing away and it's in the book and I'll make this short, she was passing away of cancer. And she was very, very, for a couple of days, she had not really been conscious, but she was still breathing. And my sister and I were laying in a bed, one on either side of her. And she was 53 when she died. Um, and Aralam said to me, I want you to see something. He said, I want, because I was holding her hand on one side and my sister was asleep and holding her hand on the other. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. And Aralam had been showing me, because my mother had been in a lot of pain, Aralam was showing me all of these guides, her guides and all of these other guides doing what I described earlier, which was above the bed, kind of in the ceiling area, all of these guides were holding, almost like weaving their arms together, their energetic arms together, making sort of this nest that almost looked like the, the Milky Way in colors. And all of a sudden, I started to see the light coming up from her, from her solar plexus, like a, it almost looked like a string of cotton candy being pulled into this vortex above her. And as I was watching this happen, I could feel the pull of it. I could feel the pulling away. And at one point he said to me, you need to let go of her hand now. And I couldn't let go of her hand. And he said, you need to let go of her hand now. And he said it a little louder and I didn't let go of her hand. And I started to feel myself sort of being pulled with her because it was, you know, I loved her. She was a tough, tough cookie, but I loved her. And I felt myself being pulled with her. And he said to me, let go. And I, I let go of her hand and I broke that. And she just, she was like this. And then she took two breaths and she was gone. And it was such a gift for me because I always feel the lobby as a little bit of a pull for myself, if that makes sense. Meaning my attention because it's phenomenal there. It's it's miraculous. This this is where we go. If I get hit by a bus or I die of cancer or I I fall down a flight of stairs or I I mean all the myriad of ways you can go, right? All your NDEs, all the ways they go. And you get there and you just go, "Oh my gosh, I'm home." I mean, it it has this real pull of being home because it is home, right? So, to circle back around to your question, Sitting here in these lifetimes, we are, like I say, we are at about that 90% of our soul energy is here with us because we need to be here to get the lessons, to do what we came to do, right? To do all these things. But we're always connected to the other side. We're always connected. And that connection cannot be broken, which is why it's so beautiful because you can't not go back. You can't not go back home. You can be a scientist or a physicist or a biologist and you can say, listen, when you die, chemicals shoot off in your brain, and that's why people think this. But from my point of view, it's just not the truth. I mean, maybe chemicals do that, but it's it's a that has to be an integral part of your soul leaving your body because you go home. You go back home. You mentioned something earlier about separating your soul from the creator. Yeah. And quite a bit we talk about we either are extensions of the creator or part of the creator is within us. But from what you're saying, it sounds like we can be completely separate from the creator. Well, we're never to be separate from the creator. Um, and Errolim is saying, he's asking me to let him explain it. So um, in the book, he, he's saying, in the book, I talk about this a little bit. The creator made us all from that creation energy that the creator is God. I mean, God is a little bit of a loaded word for people. I use the word creator. There's no male or female to the creator. The creator is all things, right? Everything's possible from that space. So we are all a piece of that energy all the time, always. We're never disconnected from the creator. We are never disconnected. However, the caveat is that there are species out in our universe over eons of time that determined that they wanted to be 
um, not have lifetimes. They wanted to be able to live forever. They wanted to be able to make clones of themselves. They wanted to be able to be in complete control of what they do, never having to answer back to that home, never having to answer back. Because if you take the creator away, if you remove your soul from creation, if you take yourself away, mechanically do it, you never have to answer to God again. So you, your conscience is, is as well connect, disconnected because your conscience and, you, and your soul are very connected up. So we are never disconnected, but Aralam is saying, but there are species that have done that. And it's not a good thing to do. It's, it's just, it's not what the creation is about. And in all, and, and he also, Aralim is also saying right now, you know, our creator, God, the creator, it, ours is not the only universe. And he's saying physicists are now, you know, string theory, all the different people that are studying this in some of the black budget programs, particularly, which don't come out to us all the time. Um, you know, they're understanding now that there are multiple universes. Now, here's the interesting thing. Aralim says that right now the creator has a real lockdown on people jumping universes. Timelines is a different thing. Timelines, there are people that are manipulating timelines, but to actually get from our universe, our creation, the, the, the creation stage that we live in, we're not jumping universe to universe. The, the, the creator's not letting our species do that at this point. Our universe is closed. Um, but timelines within our universe can be messed with, um, which is another thing that isn't loved by the creator. What's become popular lately is that we've been talking about this realm that we live in is basically some type of simulation. What does Aralam um, say Aralam about that? Aralam disagrees with that. He does not. He, he says the lifetimes that we live and the earth plane, it is not a computer simulation, meaning it's not, not it's not fake. Um, the dark matter fabric that we all work within and that we all create within and that we all agree upon is a, is an actual, it's an actual place. We are on a solid, well, as solid as matter can be, right? But the place that we are is not a computer simulation. We aren't in some program. Um, from what he says, that isn't how he experiences it or how he has learned it. Um, so he disagrees with that piece of it. However, he's saying the reason that a lot of humans are feeling like that's where we are now is because of the people that are manipulating the timelines. Because he say, he's saying there are scientists right now that are really, really trying to manipulate our timelines. And I don't want to get too, you know, too far out. I don't know how too far out for your listeners are about something like timelines, but you can actually, you can actually go down that rabbit hole and see that there are a lot of scientists doing that. So what happens with that is that the creator's timeline in this universe will keep jumping back to the original timeline that the creator wants us to be on. So when you have people trying to shift it one way or the other for their own needs and their own nefarious reasons, eventually the creator keeps bumping us back to the same timeline. So it's not like they're winning, but it, it's very disconcerting for people that are on planets in this universe, you know, and all the, I mean, there are, Erlam tells me that there are more inhabited planets at all levels in our whole universe than, than we really have numerological numbers to describe. And, and many of them are humanoid-like. Nothing to me is too out there for my audience. Right. <laughs> so you know, you know, because there's the other thing is that um, the interesting thing is that the NDE experience, it it when people start t started talking about this and like your show is so phenomenal and I know I'm 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 a fan so I'm Thank kind you. of a blushing fan of yours but but it's so phenomenal because it opens up people to understand that you know. We are so much bigger than what our societal norms would tell us. You know, we're capable of so much more. We're capable of manifesting phenomenal things. We're capable of growth. We're capable of creating an art and, you know, scientific things. And just, you know, I mean, so many things that we are capable of, the NDE experience opens up for people because if you can understand that that is our reality then all of a sudden you realize well wait there's so much more to me that i need to look at i'm not just i'm not just a, a an organic body that drops and then it's over it's really not over in a hundred years you know because you'll have multiple of, of hundred years that you're going to work things out can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by shifting timelines yeah so basically, 
you know, our whole planet has been on this timeline for a very long time. Um, and one of the things that Aralem writes about in the book, and, and people can hear this on a lot of different programs, a lot of different places, uh, two or three, um, two or three different species from other planets intersected us when we were sort of savanna dwelling pre-humanoids, right? We were, we were standing up straight, but we weren't, we didn't have the big frontal cortex yet. We weren't big thinkers. We were kind of, you know, savanna dwellers. Well, they showed up, they wanted the resources. I'm making this very short. They didn't mm -hmm. want to do the physical work. So they started manipulating our DNA, manipulating our DNA until they could get a worker who was smart enough to do all the things they needed us to do. But they also left a lot of our gray matter um, kind of switched off, right? Switched off because they didn't want us to be, they didn't want us to be um, too independent because they needed us to just follow the, the you know, they're going to give us our schedule. We're going to follow that schedule. Well, Aralim has, and in the book he writes about, that was a complete criminal act by those three species. The only, the only, the only entity in our universe who was allowed to make a new species or evolve a new species through DNA is at the creator's behest. Meaning if, if a very evolved civilization found a planet like ours, it sounds like bureaucracy, but this is what Aralam tells me happens. Um, they need to literally ask the creator, we would like to speed this up. We know you put these, you put this species on a timeline, this planet earth, you know, you put them on a timeline. We would like to, in a hundred years, we would like to get this species, you know, forward by 500,000 years. And the creator can say no to that, or the creator can say yes to that. The three species that did this to us, they did not ask, they just did it. Now, one of those species was one of the species that I talk about who already had turned themselves into um, biological drones so that they had already, they were no longer even connected to the creator, to God. So they came in and they did this. <clears throat> Ultimately, they found out, they were found out, and God sent in a kind of a council of very highly evolved beings and said, look, now you're trapped in a covenant. We're going to, you have to stay here and you have to take care of this new species and you have to set up, you know, help them to set up societies and do all this stuff. And you, and, and you cannot lord it over them. One of the things they were not supposed to do in the covenant, they were not supposed to tell us that they were gods. They weren't supposed to do that. Well, they were trapped here for a long time. They did do that. They set up all these religions around themselves and Eventually, the creator started to, he sent, you know, different teachers in to try to sort of get us on a different path. Well, long story short, as of 1962, that covenant ended. So in 1962, Aralim is saying the, the, the covenant that, in other words, the punishment for those off-world species that did this to us, the covenant ended. And when that ended, um, God also allowed all of the DNA in our brain that, that supposedly we weren't using all the connections to the galaxy, all the, all of our bigger connections to God, because we were born with souls and the species that tried to manipulate us, they were trying to have us born without souls. They didn't want us to be the creator's children anymore, but they couldn't make it work. So eventually they went ahead and just did it with souls. And of course, the minute they started making, making us different, but still having souls, you know, just like that, a light went off on the other side. And the creator says, whoa, 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 what's going on over there on that earth planet? We've got, we've got some criminals over there doing some things with my children. He's not, they're not supposed to be doing. So we've just in 62 been released from this covenant. And that's also why Aralim is saying, and he's saying right now, uh, that's also why about that time is when all of a sudden, and you can sort of look back in our history from 1962 forward, so many things started exploding out, whether it was our politics, the art world, music, spirituality, human rights, um, you know, racial rights, women's rights, all of these things started exploding. And now, and the technology, the other thing was that up until that time, um, we were not being allowed to really see other species coming to this planet, only here and there, you know, where people were sort of seeing them, but it's starting to come into our zeitgeist right now. It's starting to really be something that most people assume is true. 
So we are outside of the covenant, which is great because now we are able to really walk in the power and the light of who we really were supposed to be. But Erlim is saying, um, what we need to understand is that the creator God would have spent another probably half a million years letting us slowly be Savannah dwellers. We weren't meant to be pushed forward this quickly, but now that we are, the universe is going to open up for us. Our galaxy is going to open up for us in the next hundred years. You know, we're not going to kill ourselves with nukes. Um, Aralem has said that right along. I mean, there'll be some, some tricky areas and tricky things, um, but ultimately we're not going to, we're not going to destroy ourselves. We're going to make the leap this time, which is why it's such a great time to be alive. Sorry, that was a long explanation. No, it was great. So the timeline jump is that by them doing that, by them seeding us at that time, they forced us into another timeline, but now we're free to be on our own timeline again. And some of the people that are still in power, some of those people from the oldest, you know, family lines and the oldest that time, they still are sort of through science trying to shift us back to something that's more controllable, but there's too many of us that are out now. So meaning there's too many of us that have broken free of that old timeline that they put in and God has released us from that covenant. So basically, you know, our creator, the universe, the other side, the galaxy, our galaxy, everybody's kind of going, Hey, shaking hands. Welcome to the party. You guys are finally kind of coming into your own. And there, there are a lot of species interested in us because what happened to us doesn't happen very often. doesn't happen very often. Usually creation of life, new life is through the creator and it's brought along in very, very huge, long increments of time. And we were like, jump started and then given all of this stuff and kind of tamped down in other places because a lot of species were way more um, in tune with ESP and clairvoyance and clairaudience and all that stuff. And so we're just now coming into our gifts sort of, which is awesome. A lot of people believe that reincarnation is a soul trap and we're forced to come here over and over again. And I think they believe that especially because there's so much suffering that goes down here. Can Erlam yeah. comment on that? In my opinion, this is Erlam speaking. I'm just going to let him speak. In my opinion, and from what I've seen from my side here in the lobby, reincarnation is not a soul trap and a soul is never forced to reincarnate. Melissa could come back after this lifetime and she could never reincarnate again if that's what she choose, choose to do. Um, the issue is that after a certain amount of time, and time is very different on the other side here, we don't have time the way that you have time on your planet. Uh, here on this side, time is, is nothing. There is no time. All time is all, it's all right now. Everything is right now. Everything is a possibility. So when you come over, you never have to reincarnate again. However, incarnating even into difficult lives is one of the most satisfying things that souls do. Because when you incarnate into very difficult, tragic, difficult lifetimes, those lessons that you're learning yourself and the souls that you've come in with raise you all up levels so that when you return back and you've all done a good job, then you're just bigger souls, you're fuller, and you don't have to re you don't have to relearn those lessons. Um, he's saying, so now he's saying, so yeah, so, and this is me now. So, so people aren't forced to reincarnate. They are not forced to do that. You're never forced to come back here if you don't want to. But in my world, and from what I understand, and, and I've talked to so many souls on the other side in sessions with people and soul guides, right? And the thing is, is that you don't only, people don't only um, incarnate onto this planet. You could, you know, your next time around, you could decide to incarnate to some planet that's 90% ocean where you're, where you're an amphibious style humanoid who lives your whole life underwater, under beautiful, clean, you know, I mean, there's, there's a planet that is not in the solar system. And, and Erlim is saying, it's in a small solar system. And he's saying it's like what would be 120 light years from here. 
Um, the whole planet is covered with water and the, the beings that are indigenous to that planet, they're all underwater all the time. But what they do is, is they use toning. They use fractal toning. It's some of the sounds we would hear, but a lot of the sounds are too high or low for us to hear, but it's toning. That whole planet resonates like a giant watery bell and just sends out healing to the whole, all the galaxies around them just sends out healing. That's what they do for their whole life on that planet. I mean, hmm. how cool is that? Right? So you're never forced to come back here to earth either. And the other thing Errol M wants me to say here is that you don't have, to, sometimes he hears people saying, and I might've heard it on your show, people saying you have to graduate from the earth planet in order to go to other planets. Errol M is telling me, and he's saying right now, every single plant, every single human being um, that is incarnating to earth now as babies, everybody who's alive on the planet today, you, every single soul that is on earth now that is going to be on earth from this point forward, starting in 62, those souls all were at a high enough level of learning that they would never be forced back to this planet. So in other words, there's nobody left on earth and nobody who's ever going to incarnate to the earth as it sits right now. Because we're in a big shift time, right? So the earth is also shifting up with the rest of the galaxy, but nobody on the earth plane is at a low enough incarnative level that they would have to come back. Everybody's graduated the earth plane. The reason we're all here right now is because earth just came out of this covenant and we're kind of special. Like coming to earth right now is a really special, cool kind of trip because it can be so difficult. It can be so frightening. But on the other hand, I mean, you know this, you can have a day when you look at the news and you think, this can't be real. Like these, this can't be happening. But on the other hand, you can talk with someone or have a spiritual experience and you think, this is the, this is a phenomenal time to be alive. You know, I mean, people are doing phenomenal things as well as there's part of the world that's crazy, but everybody coming in right now is really motivated, even if they're not remembering yet. They're really motivated to be here now and do this work and be in the bulk of people who understand that we're all going to shift up together and it's okay. It's, it's going to be all right. You know, the Christians and the Jews and the, you know, native American, I mean, whatever your religious background is, if you can keep your, if you can keep your contact with the creator good and you just do the best you can do um, and keep your thoughts good you know, we're all going to, we're all going to get there together. We're all going to do this together. So that's, it's just a, a great time to be alive. With 8 billion people on the planet, do you think that a huge chunk of the people that are here now are from other systems? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's, Errol is shaking his head saying, good question. Um, he just said, good question, Jeff. Um, so yes, basically Errol is showing me, uh, and he he's showing me that right now in the lobby, I call it the lobby, on the other side, there are there are a hundred times more souls basically doing this. I'd like to, could I, I'd like to get in line. I'd like to get the lottery ticket that says I can go there now. Like everybody wants in. Everybody who has come from all different planets, um, different parts of the universe even, different galaxies, solar systems, the whole thing. And they're all willing to go into human bodies specifically to have this experience because like I said, right now where the earth is, is and how we're shifting up right now, there aren't, the airline is saying there are two other planets in the whole universe who are exactly where we are in our spiritual and geological evolution right now. Um, he's saying there's only two other planets. So everybody's trying to get onto earth and these two other planets in order to like, kind of, you know, it's like, it's like we're in a master's degree program down here. Like we are you know, we're, we're, we're going for our masters on, on being souls and bodies and what you can do with that. And it has to do with so many things. It's not just about your soul. It's about art and music and, you know, engineering and developing sciences and it, everything, everything is, is ramping up. So, yeah. Do you know of non-player characters or some people call them background people? Oh, yeah, that that kind of goes along with the um, if we were in a computer simulation, like are there like like avatars, right? Just people that are just stuck in there as placeholders. Um, Airlam is telling me right now that about a hundred years ago, 
Um, that would have been true on this planet because there were there were watchers, basically watchers, right? People like the men in black, people would say the men in black show up. Well, there were a lot of men in black early in the 1900s who were showing up to kind of see what we're doing, see what's going on. But those people at this point are not on the planet. Pretty much everybody, every body, every actual organic body moving around our planet right now has a soul in it and is here to be dancing the dance to, to do this ride. Um, because after the covenant ended, the control grid has fallen away. Aralim is saying the energy control grid, the spirituality control grid, the political control grids, even the geo magnetic control grids, everything is shifting away from all of that containment that we had by those nefarious players, that's all shifting away. And he's saying it's why right now everything feels very, you know, everybody feels, everything feels not super stable. Everything feels not super stable. Um, and that, and the reason is, is because we're getting this incredible upsurge of freedom, freedom to kind of move about the cabin if we were on an airplane, right? We're getting this incredible freedom. And of course, with that can come some pretty, you know, sleepless nights where you're waking up thinking what is going on in the world, but it's also a, just an amazing time because, you know, and Erlim is saying now it's really important now to really be good to yourself, be kind to yourself. He's saying, let your body sleep when it needs to sleep, eat the good foods, stay away from the things that, you know, bring your levels of energy down. Um, and he, he's saying, I'm not, he's saying, I'm not saying that in a cliche way. I'm saying it in the most literal way. If you're still smoking cigarettes, cut that out. If you're, you know, have your glasses of wine, but don't be an alcoholic. Try not to be a drug addict. Like do the things you need to do. <clears throat> if you need to lose 300 pounds, start thinking about it. Not in a, and he's saying not in a way where you're, where you're um, berating yourself, but in a way where you say now, Hey, I want to make the next 30 years of this journey or 50 years or whatever you've got left. And I want a really good organic vehicle to be doing it in, you know, because it's going to be a really amazing time. Trying times, but amazing. I believe a lot of people who watch this podcast are grieving over the loss of loved ones. What advice does Aralem have for those people? Okay. So, and, and he deals with this a lot in the sessions. Um, so the best thing that you can do when you've lost a loved one, number one, understand that they are not in the ground, cold and alone. That is that is not the truth of what happens. Your loved one would have passed away. Their soul goes to the other side and will be met by people that are there before them, people that have been around with them. It's like they went home to family. So that piece of it is very, very literally correct. Secondarily, your loved ones have all the opportunity in the world to be checking in on you. And they do a hundred percent of the time they do, particularly in the early days when they've left, they check in on you. They leave you signs. They will uh, work to make things go your way. They will uh, work so that things happen in the way that you want. I mean, even things like job promotions or home purchases, or if you want to have a child or all of the different things, they do things from the other side to, to assist you. They're always involved. Oftentimes, more than I ever would have imagined, souls will say that you have grandma and grandpa, and they have three kids who then have four children, right? So you've got grandma and grandpa are old, their kids are in their 50s, their kids are in their 30s. Say that's generally what it is. Grandpa passes over, and for the first five Earth years that Grandpa's over there, he comes back. He's, you know, if if Grandma sits in her special chair that she always sat in to read, he'll sit with her in the chair he always sat in, you know. And the dog will sit at the bottom of the chair because he's his energy is sitting there with her because he knows she's got a couple more years before she's coming over. He'll check in on her. But the other thing he might do is, if one of his grandchildren suddenly is going to become pregnant, he might have agreed and decide to come in to that child. That's how we rotate through lifetimes and through families and through lessons. But your, your loved ones who have passed over, they're not suffering. Nobody's in hell. Um, where they are now is so incredible. It's like, it's like everything that you would ever want to see or learn or do or experience or taste or feel or smell or hear 
anything that you want to do. If, if your loved one loved horses, well, once they've passed over and gone through their life review, they can create their perfect horse farm there with some of the friends they've had there for eons and eons of time. And still every Tuesday can check in on you if they want to do that, you know, and they do do that. The other thing is that well, there's only about, Erilyn is saying there's only about 30 to 38% of people right now on the planet who are fully open intuitively, meaning who are like, there are people walking around right now that have full-blown ESP. They don't even know it. They have full-blown clairaudience. They don't even know it. Um, they have full-blown um, intuitive skills, meaning when they go to, you know, they're going to go to drive to work, but they suddenly think, I'm going to take that route today. Well, the reason they're doing that is because they're intuiting a car crash that's going to happen. So, but even if they don't understand that they're doing it, they're doing it. So because of that, um, Aralem is saying to all of, uh, of your listeners who have lost loved ones, whether it's five minutes ago or 50 years ago, um, your loved ones will always leave things for you. Things that are meaningful to you, you know, feathers, leaves, birds. I mean, it, it could be anything. If, 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 th if your thimble collection is meaningful to you, then your loved one can put one in your path. You know what I'm saying? Um, songs, music, your loved ones will do all kinds of things. So what he's saying right now is he said, whenever you believe, whenever you think to yourself, oh, look at that bird. John loved those birds. Those were his favorite birds. That is, believe that. That's John. That's John. 99% of the time, that's your loved one giving you a sign, giving you a signal. The second way that loved ones come to us all the time is in dreams, 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 dreams. So whenever you're dreaming about your lost loved one, always know that that's not, people say, oh, it was just a dream. That's just me wanting. It's not. It's energetic. It's energetic. And our dreams are the best place for someone to contact us, particularly people who aren't particularly comfortable with all the intuitive, um, the intuitive stuff. You know, I had a friend who said to me, you know, why doesn't everybody's, why doesn't everybody on the, why doesn't everybody's guide just start talking to them? And I said, well, <laughs> can you imagine if in the next five minutes, every single person on the planet suddenly had Aralam in their head talking to them in real time. That wouldn't go well. Like a lot of people wouldn't love that. So, so all of the ways that you think your loved ones might connect with you, they absolutely do. A song comes on the radio, something that you two did together suddenly is in your vision, dreams, colors. It can be anything. It can be anything. It could be a stranger sending you uh, you know, a cupcake in a box because they were thinking of you and you realize it's something special to you and that loved one. I mean, it's, there's no end to what it can be, the signs, because they send them all the time. The other thing Erilyn is saying right now is the very best thing you can do for your loved ones that are gone. The best thing that you can do is cry your tears and then out loud when you're alone, sit in a chair and say, I know you're here. I know that you are fine. I know that you're happy. I know that you know how much I love you and I can, I'm fine. I'm fine. The best thing you can do is be fine. It doesn't mean you don't cry or that you don't have hurt feelings, but the very best thing you can do is say out loud to your loved one that, that I'm fine and I love you. And I know you're present for me. I know you're working for me on the other side, but I'm fine. And I'm going to be okay. And you can also, Erilyn is saying also, you can ask your loved ones to give you signs and you can ask your guide as well, you know, and, and asking your guide for signs that your guide is there is, is, the, is just a good way to do things as well, because they'll also give you all those kinds of signs, all those kinds of things. Can Erilyn give us any tips to raising our energy and open ourselves for more abilities? Yes. So he's saying right now, he's saying the he's saying, this is so simple that it seems difficult. Opening yourself has everything to do with just believing that, that you have this ability innately within you. You have to accept it. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. But accepting it means when you start to sit in a chair and think, I'm just going to open myself 
to source. I'm going to open myself to God. I'm going to, I'm going to make a decision tomorrow and I want to use my intuition. I want to, I want to get guidance for that decision. You have to shut down the part of your inner talk, your, your inner talk that says, don't be silly. Don't be stupid. What are you doing? You can't do this. This isn't real. Errol Am is saying to me right now, the time on your planet right now, there's no time left for people to, to pretend they don't know who they are. He's saying, you have to stop pretending that you don't know who you are. So the tip would be just really know that you're capable. Understand that your brain and your soul are connected. Your brain and your soul are connected and that your brain and your soul are both connected to the creator on the other side. And because you have that connection, you, you can expand your abilities at your own will. And now he's also saying, don't try to go too fast. Don't, don't try to go too fast. Just little by little, accept that you already can do it. See yourself as doing it rather than trying to do it. It's just the same with manifesting. We were talking earlier about manifesting. So if you wanted to manifest a new job for yourself, it's not so much that you think about what job you want. It would be more that you need to get quiet and in your mind's eye, imagine what would my perfect job be? Okay, well, I'd be sitting at a beautiful desk. I would have a window in my office. I would have plants in my office. I would be able to have my dog in my office. I would have low music on in my office. My window would be overlooking you fill in the blanks. And then I feel this way when I'm sitting here. I feel comfortable in my chair. I feel satisfaction. I feel that I love this job. I love the people I work with. I'm never tired when I get here. You know, this is what you need to do. And it's the same with all of your innate abilities to have intuition and creativity and, and all of it and connection. Errol M is also saying that for anybody who's an artist, um, the other good way to get in touch with that is to paint or draw or automatic write. Those are all really good ways as well. We haven't mentioned it yet, but your book is called Being oh. Humans. Yes. What is your goal in writing this book? Well, let me hold it up. Shameless plug. It's Being Humans. Um, the goal is, the book is two part. It's a lot of my childhood stories, which were pretty terrifying. They are they are then followed up by Errol M talking about how you can heal from some of the most tragic and difficult trauma and how to turn it all around so that those things become strengths for you. And how also, if, if you go into... This book is a lot about where we are right now on our planet and where we're kind of going out into the galaxy, like in real time. But it's also about if people start to look at all of the things and experiences in their life, what if everything difficult in your life, you had you had decided to come in and experience? What if you chose the difficult things so that you could grow positively through them, survive them? And then be a much bigger, you know, more balanced soul because of them. And so the book is basically to get people to stop looking at their life from a victim mentality. Because no matter what situation you're in, even if, even if you were, you're terminal with a, an illness, right? You've got three months to live. You still can decide how you respond to that. You can decide what you do, what you think, how you feel about it, how you treat other people around it. What do you do with your three months? Do you even accept that three months is all you have, right? You, you can decide an awful lot. And so the minute you start deciding what you're going to do in response to these difficult situations, that's when you get control of them. And oftentimes people spontaneously heal. I mean, the, the world is kind of wide open as to what's what's possible, no matter where you start from. And Erlam also is really, really um, big on the idea that so many times people who go through traumatic childhoods, um, and everybody has something in their childhood. I mean, it's hard to talk to anybody who doesn't have some kind of childhood trauma, right? But people feel very isolated by that usually, and they feel very alone by that. So the book is meant to, to sort of let as many people as possible understand, look, even if your dad, you know, beat the snot out of you once a week for the first 10 years of your life, what can you do to not have that influence your whole life? 
because you wouldn't have come into a lifetime to not grow from that, right? You would have come into a lifetime to understand what that was, understand that that was all about him, not about you or who you are, and then let it go. Not let it go like let it go, but let it go out of your psyche so that your soul can grow and move forward. Because if you can do that in this lifetime, you'll never come back to a lifetime to learn that lesson. You know? Um, so it's a lot about that. It's about shifting your perception of yourself in a way that really makes you very powerful in your own life, powerful to heal and powerful to grow and also powerful enough to let everybody around you, um, make mistakes and still be loved by you and still grow themselves so that they don't make more of those mistakes. It's like, you know, they say the curses, uh, the curse of the father goes to the children, you know, family curses throughout time. Well, right now, everybody who's born onto this planet, one of the biggest things that everybody is supposed to be doing is stopping the family curses. Like everybody who's here is trying to heal and stop something right now so that we can all shift up, everybody. And, and that's that's really what the book is about. So it's interesting because the book has a lot of really kind of gripping stories in it, which kind of grab you as not being real, like maybe it's fiction, but it wasn't fiction. It was just my life. And then Errol M talks about all of that. And he talks about how how to grow from those things and 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 why I responded in certain ways. And and, and it's it's really it's an interesting way to have a, a kind of a, a, a self-help spiritual book because there's a lot of real stuff in it. But Erlam talks a lot about, he also talks a lot about science and quantum physics and where earth is in our galaxy and what's going on and what's coming down the pike and all of that. If people want to find out more about your book, do they find it on your website or yep, on Amazon? Uh, yep. I am at melissagatesperry.com. I am also on YouTube, which is where I listen to your fabulous show, which I'm now on. Like Thank I said, you. I'm a little starstruck about that because I'm just, I think your work is phenomenal. Um, I'm also, they can get the book on Amazon and, you know, all the places you buy books online. Um, and, um, and the book's doing actually pretty well. I haven't done a ton of, um, PR work on the book and it's been kind of word of mouth, but, um, it, I've met a lot of people now and I'm sort of doing some cool stuff and the book's doing pretty well. So I'm excited about that. If people want to reach out to you and ask you questions, should they do Absolutely. that from your um, website? If you go to my website, melissagatesperry.com, there is a page there where you can contact me and I'll get right back to you. And I'll do, you know, I do sessions with groups sometimes or single people and, you know, you can, we can set something up. So, yeah. Do you have anything else you're working on that you want us to know about? Well, um, actually there's going to be a book two on this. Um, so that'll be pretty, pretty interesting too. And I'm doing more podcasts, um, as well as yours, although yours is kind of right up my alley because, mm -hmm. you know, your folks, it's so interesting because all of your NDE folks are, they're basically going to the lobby and then not going in, not fully going in. Right. And then they're coming back, which I think is, is really awesome. And, the other thing, and Erlam wants to say one more thing, and this is to all of your folks who have been on the NDEs, um, anyone who's had an NDE in the last 30 years, these people are having NDEs specifically in order to come back and talk about it. So the having an NDE at this point in history on our planet, you would have put that in your soul lesson plan for this life. Um, and maybe, you know, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty bold move to say, hey, I want to come into this lifetime and I'm going to help a ton of people um, by having this experience and coming back. Um, that's really, really cool. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't think it was so cool at the moment, but the point is that's some big work. You know, they're doing some big work with that. I was considering asking that question because yeah. quite a few people will say that they felt like they planned their NDE pre-birth. Yes, that, that's just what Erlim just said to be sure to say that to you. Yes. So they did everybody. And he's saying in the last 30 ish years, um, every single NDE that returned, obviously it's not an NDE if they don't return, but everybody who's come back from that experience, um, put that in their lifetime. Now, again, they could have gotten here and not, um, not segued with that timeline, but, um, it's, but he said, everybody that has everyone that's had that experience now, um, they would have put that in there as a possibility for a huge growth arc. And the thing is, 
not only are they having that growth themselves, but once they start talking about it, and especially on a show like this one, all of a sudden, how many people have had NDEs who have never said anything about it, watch the show and realize, I really am a soul moving a body around. I am not a, I'm not a mind. I am not an intellectual mind moving a body around. I am a soul allowing a mind and a body to move around. And there's a, that's a huge distinction because moving around as a soul, the other thing is, and you know this, I'm sure the days, if you have a day where for most of the day, you're really in touch with your own soul and you let your soul kind of, you let your soul be the face of your day. Meaning you run your whole day from that place of soul. Those days are sweet. Are they not? Those days feel magical in a different way because you just aren't worrying and you're just not, you know, you're just being, you're just being. And that's really what it's all about is getting to that place where you can just be in your life really authentically. And I know that sounds a bit cliche, but it's not meant to be. You can really just be in your life super authentically without worrying about anything. You're not worrying about anything, right? That's where we we all want to get to because the more people that can get to that place, um, the better the earth is going to be. Just everything gets better. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? <laughs> I could talk message? forever, by the way. <laughs> well, I already want you back for another um, absolutely podcast, absolutely. so I'm glad that you're writing another book. Yes, absolutely. So before you finish up, can you leave us yes. with one last positive message? Yes. So the positive message would be this. And... Um, I'm going to let Erlam talk first. Erlam is saying, the time is now for anyone who hears this, anyone who reads the book, the time is now to understand just how huge and positively powerful you are. If you are on the planet today, you are a hugely positive soul. You are at the perfect time. You're in perfect placement. You're meant to be here and you're supposed to be doing every single thing that lights up your soul, that lights up your face, that lights up those around you. So just try to anchor yourself in all of the positive things. Even when you're going through the negative challenging lessons, try to anchor yourself in the idea that you are a huge positive soul and that you will never be disconnected from the creator God. That's Erlam. I would say, well, Erlam took my speech, <laughs> but um, I would say sort of the same thing. And I, I, was, I would also say this, everybody needs to just try to be, anytime you're going to make a decision before words come out of your mouth, if it's going to be important words, try to think to yourself, what would I have wanted to do in this situation? If you have to have the, the difficult talk with someone or you need to make a difficult um, decision about staying or going or whatever it is, just always try to come from this place of not a logical place, but try to think about your soul and what's going to be the, the kind of the highest good in the situation. And also everybody just needs to like, be happy, be happy, be who you are. You know, if, if anything, my connection to the lobby and my connection to Airlam and, and with all the things that I went through, you know, for me, I think to myself, life is amazing. Even on the worst days that I've had, and I've had some pretty bad days with health issues when I was much younger, different things. If you're awake and it's the morning, it is amazing that you're here. It's amazing that we're all here. And so we just need to enjoy it so much more and enjoy each other and just lift lift up the people around you. Just Even if they're never going to lift you up, it doesn't matter. Just lift up the people around you. Because you can't go wrong with that. You really can't. And life is fabulous. Life is just amazing. So that would be my piece of it from a human standpoint. Melissa, thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. And I always I look forward to watching your videos every day. And I absolutely would love to come back. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.